Welcome to our second lecture covering chapter six of our textbook. Uh, the topic of this chapter is legally managing property. And uh, as you can see, there are five topics. In our first lecture, we covered, um, let me make this a slideshow. In the first lecture, we covered an introduction to property. We defined a lot of terms. We talked about how one goes about purchasing property and how one, as of course part of purchasing the, the property, how one might finance it. In this lecture, we'll talk about leasing property, which is of course an alternative to purchasing. We'll actually compare uh, the advantages and disadvantages to leasing versus purchasing. And we'll also talk about intellectual property, which is a special type of property. Um, in the earlier parts of the uh, lectures, we've talked about personal property, and we've talked about real property, and now we'll be talking about a third type of property, which is intellectual property. So let's fast forward to, I think it's slide 28, <clears throat> so we can talk about Okay, so we're talking about leasing property and obviously as a, a hospitality manager, you may be the person who is leasing property um, uh, to someone else or you might be the person who is leasing the property for your own possession, You're leasing it from someone else. So what is a lease? Well, it's a type of contract. Uh, much of the contract law that we've talked about in previous lectures apply to leases, but there are definitely some twists with leases that don't apply to all types of contracts. So it's a good practice to have legal counsel review a lease before you actually sign it. Uh, but thinking about it as a contract is definitely a helpful way to, to consider it. The things that you need for a contract, you would also need for a lease. So a lease is a type of contract that establishes the rights of each party, the owner of the property, as well as the person who is going to possess the property or occupy the property. So again, with the lease, the issue is possession or occupation, not ownership. Ownership doesn't change. The owner still owns it, although the owner's ability to possess or use the land is either completely ending for a period of time or perhaps is being restricted in some way. So let's go over some uh, of the identities of the individuals. The lessor, you can see here we have this OR ending, which means in the law, Whenever we see an OR ending in a word, this is the person who does the less, or really in this case, the lease. So this is the owner of the property, the person who uh, currently has the right to possess and who is willing to relinquish much or all the right to possess in exchange for typically money. And another name for that lessor is landlord, or I guess you could say landlady. It's obviously kind of an old fashioned term. Uh, back in the, the days of uh, kings and queens and things along those lines. Obviously, uh, we still use that term today, but we could also equally well use the term landlord. Um, so you, I said before that um, hospitality managers can be the, uh, the lessor or the lessee, the landlord or the tenant. And you may have thought, well, gee as I see how um, a, a hospitality manager can be a tenant he, his restaurant or his hotel may not actually own the, the, the land or the facility in which it's, it's in. It may be leasing that from another entity. But how would a hospitality manager be a landlord? And that comes up when, let's say you are a hotel manager <clears throat> and you have a flower shop inside your hotel. It is certainly possible for you to um, actually have your own employees operate that um, flower shop and um, all the profits can go to the business. In other words, it's just another function of the larger hotel, just like the, the larger hotel uh, cleans the rooms and maintains the swimming pool and maintains the grounds. They could also maintain the flower shop or the gift shop or the coffee, uh, coffee shop or things like that. Uh, so that's certainly a model, but many hotels decide to have tenants or other businesses rent the space within that larger entity um, and then um, that uh, the, the person who gets the space runs his or her business and pays some type of rent to the hotel. <clears throat> so in that sense, the uh, hospitality manager can be both a um, tenant as well as a landlord. And so here we, we have the other term. So just like we have a lessor here, the OR ending, 
when we have the EE ending, that tells us this is somebody who receives the less or the lease in this case. And this again means the same thing as tenant. <clears throat> so just like lessor means landlord, lessee means tenant. And of course, this is something that the, that the hotel a manager, the hospitality manager, can easily have that relationship, um, can, can lease either the building in which the restaurant or other facility is in, or perhaps might own the building but is leasing the land. So let's look at some features of leases that are likely to be important to the owner of the land, to the lessor or the landlord. And many of these things will also be important to the lessee, of course. Obviously, you want your lease to establish how long the lease is going to be. It's likely to be for a set period of time, but there may well be a provision in the lease that might trigger uh, the earlier ending of the lease or that might cause the lease to automatically renew during a period of time. So this isn't necessarily a particular number of months. It can be, um, uh, it be a more complicated uh, uh, equation to figuring out how long the lease will last. And obviously, you'll want to have the amount of the lease. Typically, leases are paid on a monthly basis. Wouldn't have to be, but that's certainly the most common way that these are handled. <coughs> um, let's talk about net, 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 and triple net. Okay, so when a, 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 a lease amount uh, provides for some amount of rent, it may be a net agreement. And in that situation, um, the lessee pays um, the um, rent as well as the taxes on the land. Then of course the, the, the rent arrangement can be net-net, meaning um, the, the lessee does not pay taxes or, I mean, excuse me, the lessee pays taxes and insurance. And you can have a triple net situation. This is very common, very likely to be the arrangement that you see. In that situation, we see that the lessee pays taxes insurance and maintenance on the property. Um, so really the landlord is not involved in these functions in this particular situation. <coughs> a fourth way to have rent apportioned doesn't involve a flat amount of rent, instead it'll be on a percentage basis. So the um, in whatever the tenant sells, let's say the tenant has a dress shop or maybe a restaurant um, and the, the tenant has a certain amount of gross revenue, well, that tenant will pay a certain percentage as um, the, the rent that he or she pays. Now, this, of course, means that the rent will vary from month to month. It will also require a certain degree of accounting because um, you'll want, you know, you as the landlord would want to see what the tenant's books look like, and you want to make sure that the tenant isn't running, say, two sets of books. Um, usually, these types, of, these are not very common rent arrangements, and oftentimes when they exist, it's because um, the landlord wasn't able to negotiate a better arrangement. Maybe there's a glut of um, places for rent, and so it's kind of a renter's market under those circumstances. So I wouldn't count on being able to get a percentage lease in most cases. I heard at one point that um, Willow Bend Mall was, a, was offering percentage leases to its tenants. Um, so there are sometimes available, but it would usually be a sign that the um, landlord was not prospering. Keep in mind that when you have a percentage lease, it's not a percentage of profit, it's a percentage of gross revenue. So it could be that the tenant is still losing money, but still has to pay some level of rent. So you want to document the, however the rent is calculated and what responsibilities in addition to paying the rent that the lessee is going to assume. You would also want to establish what the subleasing rights of a tenant are going to be. Let's flip over and just see what the term sublet means. And again, this is sub. You're, you're, I'm sure familiar with this term. Sub means under. For instance, subway, submarine. And let in this context was referring to a lease. So to lease under. You are the tenant, but you want to become the landlord. Um, and you are then to establish another tenant underneath you. Let's imagine, let's look at it from the um, residential perspective. I rent an apartment for 12 months um, and for my landlord. Um, six months into my lease, I need to move to another location in another city. Well, I might want to sublet the apartment for the remaining six months to somebody else. Of course, I'd want to look at the terms of my lease to see if that is agreeable or not. 
Uh, many times it's not permitted under the terms of the original lease. <clears throat> okay, so you want to see what the rights, if any, are of the tenant to sublet. And then, of course, you'd want to talk about who's going to maintain insurance. What if a, a hurricane or a tornado comes through or there's a fire? And you'd also want to talk about termination rights. Of course, this is related to the length of the lease. If the tenant is behind in his um, uh, rent payments, what is the effect upon uh, the continuation of the lease? If um, certain events happen, um, maybe certain events in the uh, exist in the, in the landlord circumstances, certain events in the um, tenant circumstances could cause the lease to terminate um, automatically. And here we have the term for eviction. Um, that's the, the method that a lessor uses, that the landlord uses, to remove a lessee, a tenant, from p physical possession of a real property. It's difficult to evict a human being from his or her apartment or home. It's much easier to evict a business. Um, and you probably have gone up to a business and seen that the uh, that lessee has been locked out, that there's a notice posted about that. And that's part of that process to actually have an eviction accomplished. The most common reason that an eviction happens is when the lessee um, has ceased to pay the rent. But there can be other uh, reasons, for example, an, 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 a, a sublet arrangement that was not permitted, or there could be some damage to the property or some use of the property that is inconsistent with the terms of the lease. Let's say um, I, am, I am a shop or a owner of a respectable um, shop strip center um, in a conservative part of town um, and the, uh, the other tenants are a donut shop, a dry cleaners, um, and a dental shop. And then the fourth spot is the one that I have. I start out at initially being a, um, a taco uh, stand, and then I turn it into a um, exotic dancing place with scantily uh, clothed uh, waiters and waitresses. Well, obviously, the, the dentist's office and the donut shop and uh, whatever the third, the dry cleaners isn't going to be very happy having uh, that kind of, of uh, neighbor. And so uh, you can imagine that you're probably quickly going to be evicted. And of course, you want to make sure that your contract, is, or if you're the landlord there, that the contract is written in terms that would allow the eviction to happen uh, for not following the, the rules about how that property can be used. Now let's look at what some terms that the lessee or the tenant might be especially interested in. Uh, so we're looking at it from the other perspective now. So we would be interested in what representations the landlord has made about the property. Um, <clears throat> uh, what the condition of the HVAC unit is. Um, uh, things along those lines. Um, you'd want to, to find out uh, about those types of things. Also, what type of expenses the landlord will pay? How recent is the roof? Things along those lines. And how will the terms of the lease be renewed and can they be renewed? Sometimes they can't be renewed or sometimes uh, there is an equation that is established in the lease that establishes how a future rent increases will be handled. Uh, sometimes they're not established in that way. It's not unusual for restaurants and other businesses to close um, at the conclusion of their uh, uh, less, uh, um, lease simply because the rent has increased significantly. Um, and so it, the business that once was perhaps profitable and successful can no longer be profitable or successful with the higher rent. And of course, in this case, the landlord um, is hoping to get another tenant in place that will be able to pay that rent. There's a term used in this section of the textbook about HVAC or HVAC, and those of course stand for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning units. Um, obviously, uh, Colin recently has gotten into the HVAC technician training industry, and so um, you may be seeing students around who are involved in that particular training process. Uh, the HVAC industry is a very uh, growing one in, in Dallas. It's obviously in, in big demand to have people who have that skill set, 
and people who do that are typically well compensated. Obviously, the working conditions can be challenging because you're usually not in air conditioning. Uh, oftentimes, you're in attics and other uncomfortable places in the hottest times of the summer, um, but it is a highly skilled job that can be uh, uh, very well compensated and also has a lot of job security. So anyway, not making a plug for that particular industry, but it is something helpful to know about. <clears throat> and who would be responsible for maintaining the HVAC system in your particular lease space would definitely be something that you want would want to handle in the lease. So there can be a clarity about uh, the quality of the HVAC unit, who is going to service that unit, who is going to pay for the utilities associated with that unit, and when there are problems and when it needs to be replaced, who's going to be responsible for that? Obviously a big factor. No one's going to eat at your restaurant if your air conditioning unit is not working. Pretty basic stuff. Okay, so now we're going to compare um, the idea of buying something versus leasing something. Obviously you can't um, lease everything. Some things you have to buy. If you're a restaurant, for example, you can't you know, lease the, the steaks that you're hoping to serve to your customers that night. Uh, but many other things, a capital type of investment, you're going to be able to lease. And so you'll have to make a decision as the manager. Does it make more sense for me to use the resources of this company to buy this item or to lease it? And there isn't an obvious answer to this question. It depends upon lots of variables. And so we're going to explore some of those variables um, so that you'll be in a position to make an informed decision about what makes most sense for the, your particular business at this particular time and for the particular item you're considering buying. Okay, one thing that can be relevant is how much use are you gonna be able to get from this? I mean, if it's really important that you have unrestricted use, you're gonna probably want to purchase it versus leasing it because if you lease it, there will be restrictions. So let's say you're not quite sure what your restaurant idea is going to be. Um, you may find that it's hard to uh, lease land if you're not sure whether you're running a Hooters or you're running a five-star fine dining establishment. Uh, different landlords might be comfortable with one versus the other. And so um, now, of course, when you get to the point that you know, I definitely want to run a brunch place, um, then maybe it becomes less important that you actually purchase the space because now you know exactly what you want. And so, um, it's okay that you are no longer able to run a Hooters or you're no longer able to run a bar or something like that because you're not interested in running that type of thing. So purchasing becomes more important when you um, are wanting to keep options open in terms of use and leasing becomes more of an, uh, an option when you have a more fo focused in use. Another can have to do with the tax treatment or the accounting treatment that the cost um, of, of making that purchase that lease is going to be. If you uh, pay cash for something, you're going to be able to depreciate um, that item uh, under federal and state income tax rules. Let's look at what depreciation is. We know what appreciation is. Appreciation, the everyday conversation, of course, means that you like something, that you think it has value. But from an accounting perspective, when we say something appreciates, we're saying it increases in value. You hope, for example, that your house appreciates in value. Maybe it's worth $200,000 today if you own it. It would be lovely if in a year or two it's worth $220,000. That means it appreciated by 20%. I mean, not 20%, 20,000 by 10% in that case. But things, unfortunately, can also depreciate in value. An example would be a new car. Let's say you buy a new car for $20,000. Well, the second you drive it off the, the showroom floor, it has fallen in value. And it will continue to fall in value for, I mean, until it's very, very old, and then maybe it becomes an antique and it increases in value. Um, so depreciation is the nature of most items that you purchase other than land. And so when things depreciate, typically an item has a, a life cycle. So for example, if you buy a cash register um, for your uh, restaurant, that cash register isn't going to be in working order 50 years from now. Maybe it has a life expectancy of 10 years. And so let's say you spend uh, $2,000 for that cash register. Well, if it can last 10 years, 
then you would try to spread out that cost over those 10 years. So that would be um, <clears throat> $200 per year would be kind of the, the schedule that you would look to. Well, the schedule for depreciation is pretty much established. Um, um, and, and it's not unusual to have an item that's fully depreciated in value, but you continue to use it uh, because maybe it has experienced less wear and tear. You've been more careful or you're just willing to use things that aren't in as good a working order, maybe because you're frugal or something along those lines. So again, this establishes the structure for depreciating it for tax purposes. Unfortunately, if you lease it, you don't own it, so you don't get the opportunity to depreciate it, but you do get to treat your lease payments as deductions, as business expenses, and so those um, do uh, affect your taxes as well. And again, uh, you'll want to have a more robust understanding of these issues, and you can get that by talking about uh, tax issues with your CPA or your accountant to get more uh, detail about which which one of these treatments is better for your particular business. Sometimes your decision about whether to buy or lease becomes pretty easy because um, uh, you, you may not be able to finance something. You may not have enough cash to buy it, so to purchase it, and you may not, the item may not be something that is financeable, uh, perhaps because it depreciates too uh, rapidly and it can't really be used as collateral. Under those circumstances, the lease may be the better option. Um, if you purchase something um, and you actually pay cash for it, you may be able to use that purchased item as collateral for another loan. So that can also play out. But an item that is leased, because you don't actually own it, all you have is the right to possess it, you usually are not going to be able to use that as collateral. Liability. If you purchase it and it breaks or it causes someone else to be injured, you're going to be on the hook for it. If you lease something and it breaks or it causes someone else to be injured, whatever that item might be, um, you'll have to look to the lease to see exactly how liability plays out. You, the, land, the tenant, may be responsible. It could also be the landlord or it could also be both of you. So you'd want to look into that in more detail. Let's say you want to make improvements. Um, you want to, you are renting a space that you're going to use as a restaurant. You want to gussy it up. You want to add a bar. You want to um, do other, uh, a, 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 take a, a chattel and attach it in a permanent way so it becomes an improvement or a fixture uh, to the uh, facility. Well, if you own the land, guess what? You can do what you want, assuming that uh, in the case of a home, there may be homeowners association limitations. Um, in a strip center, you may um, encounter uh, uh, resistance from the neighbors, but if you own the, 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 the land and it's yours free and clear, and you want to change it in a certain way, it doesn't violate zoning or other rules, go for it. Of course, it's a lease situation, whatever changes, improvements you make, the landlord will need to also uh, agree to through the lease document. <clears throat> so what is a capital improvement? So when we're talking about improvements over here, uh, we really that shorthand for capital improvement. Um, that's the purchase or upgrade of something of real property, and that's usually what we're talking about when we're talking about capital improvements. Um, again, the chandelier, um, the built-in bar, um, that makes the item uh, more valuable. But you could imagine putting a stereo into a car um, or let, let's say you run a catering business and you um, install um, something into the, the catering van that you use to hold all the foods of tray appropriately or maybe to maintain the, the, uh, the, the food at a certain temperature during transport. Um, that would be a capital improvement. Um, and of course, this results in the asset having greater value um, because it now has this additional feature. Okay, uh, termination. Well, termination, uh, when you purchase something, happens when you sell it, or I guess when, it be, when it's destroyed in some respect. A lease is going to end on its own whenever the terms of the lease expire. Um, and so there's a difference there. Typically, your, your ownership interest lasts longer in a purchase situation than in a lease situation. A default. Well, if you're purchasing something and you're paying cash for it, you really can't default assuming you continue to pay your taxes. But if you purchase it through some financing mechanism, 
um, very likely the item that you're purchasing is acting as collateral so your lien holder uh, the person who is your creditor can uh, come in and foreclose on that particular property if you lease it again it's a similar situation to some extent if you stop paying your rent then the lessor can eventually evict you and see you for whatever rent that you haven't paid if it's personal property again the, the let's say the van that you use to transport your uh, catering uh, business um, the lessor can repossess um, the car or the van that you're using um, for that business if that van or car was collateral for that particular loan <clears throat> And what is a commercial lease? It's a lease that applies to a business property. And obviously that's the type of lease we're talking about here. You can obviously have personal or residential leases. Those obviously don't have a business implication for the, at least in the hospitality industry. Okay, so that's our conclusion of the topic of leasing property and now we're going to go to the last topic in our chapter which is intellectual property rights we have a course at Colin in the paralegal program that is just about intellectual property rights um, I'm going to not remember the exact number of the courses it oops I went too far it's a 2000 level course I think it's something like um, 2007, 2107, I'm not entirely sure. If you have an interest in the intellectual property course, please let me know. Ordinarily, we offer it in the spring and it does not have any prerequisites and uh, it is especially uh, of interest to individuals who are interested in becoming paralegals or maybe potential inventors entrepreneurs in that particular area. Um, it may not be directly applicable though to the hospitality industry um, in terms of the course, but of course the topic generally of intellectual property has a lot of importance to the hospitality industry because the hospitality industry is a regular consumer of intellectual property. We'll talk more about that. Let's first of all talk about the concept of intellectual property. Up until this point we've talked about real property and personal property now we're talking about intellectual property the the third um, spoke i guess in this in this particular wheel and this is a type of personal property that has been created through the intellectual efforts of its original owner um, it includes trademarks copyrights and patents um, related to trademarks is the idea of trade dress and you can also include in this, although this textbook writer chooses not to, but you could also include trade secrets as a fifth type of intellectual property. Um, but that's not something that this, this uh, uh, a, a textbook writer chose to do, so we're not gonna talk about it here. So we're gonna talk about that first item on the list, the trademark item. And a trademark is exactly what you think it is, is what it means in everyday conversation. It's a name, a symbol, or some combination of these things that causes the consumer to identify the product that sells it. When you're on the highway and from a distance you see the golden arches above, you don't think, hmm, I wonder what business that is. You immediately know it's a McDonald's. When you see this symbol on a shirt or on some tennis shoes or on some shorts, you know immediately it's Nike. And there's a million of these out there, <clears throat> a lot of car symbols. You immediately know what the brand of the car is based upon its trademark. And that's, this can be a very good marketing device um, because especially if it's a desirable trademark like Nike, putting that swoosh on the item of clothing or shoes is going to automatically increase its market value. People like to have that identification, people associate that identification with high quality. Uh, McDonald's may not be as focused on high quality, but it does have a lot of name recognition and it has a lot of consistency in its products. If you're on the highway traveling from one city to another and you are presented with two restaurants, both of which are fast casual, um, you're going to go through the driveway, one is called, you know, 
McSmith's restaurant, either it's called McDonald's, you don't know anything about McSmith. It might be the best fast food you've ever had, or it might make you sick as a dog. The McDonald's, you can be pretty confident you know what's going to be on the menu. You're going to know pretty much what the prices are going to be, and you have a pretty good idea about the quality. It's a consistent product, and for that reason, you're probably going to pull into the McDonald's over the McSmith's. Now, of course, if you know something about McSmith's, you might decide that that's the better choice for you. But a McDonald's is able to be successful in part because it has that name recognition, that well-established uh, uh, menu that people know about and that people know what to expect when they go into a McDonald's. <laughs> so that's what a trademark is. Let's talk about a patent. A patent is an invention. That's the simplest kind of way of looking at it. Um, but I can invent something and if I don't apply for a patent, I don't have any particular rights to stop other people from using my great idea. So it's very likely that I will file for a patent. And of course, when I file for a patent, I have to file it with the US government, the Patent, patent and Trademark Office. And in fact, we have a Patent and Trademark Office here in Dallas for this a several state territory. So we're kind of a, a regional leader um, in patent law in this in this uh, in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Anyway, I apply for this patent to the government, and if I'm successful in my application, then I will be able to uh, have a monopoly on the use of this patent for a 17-year period of time. Um, it's a little bit more complicated the equation, but the, the short answer is 17 years. At the end of 17 years, then anybody can use my patent. During those 17 years, I'll have to maintain the patent, but if I take all the steps, if I dot all the I's and cross all the T's, I will be the only person that will be able to use the patent unless I decide to um, give someone else the, but not give, but sell to somebody else the right to use my patented technology. This, of course, is a very complicated area. My very short discussion of it doesn't really do it justice, but at least introduces the idea to you. Now we have copyrights. This may be the most important area for you as a hospitality manager. A copyright is the right to um, reproduce, I don't really like this definition, but it has to do with creative endeavors. Uh, when a person creates something, and again, we're usually talking about some kind of artistic, interpret it, use, think of that word in a pretty broad sense, artistic endeavor. So if I write a poem or a book, if I make a painting, if I write a song, if I record the song, if I act in a play, if I sing a song, if I play my flute or my bassoon or something like that, all those would be creative endeavors. They don't have to be artistically fine. I mean, I'm a lousy singer, but if I were to record my, myself singing, as bad as it would be, it, the, the law doesn't really make judgments about, well, you know, Gruber, you are such an awful singer. That is not creative. That is just awful. We're not giving you a copyright. No, they don't evaluate and say, well, you know, when Rhonda Fleming sings, that's art. When Cynthia Gruber sings, that's awful. Um, both of us would be entitled to a copyright, despite the fact that one of our performances would be worthless. Um, <clears throat> So the, the legal system doesn't make artistic judgments. Also, what I am creating doesn't necessarily have to be artistic. I might be writing the world's most boring book about the world's most boring topic. I may just be reciting facts, but I chose what facts to include, and I chose what order to present those facts. So even though it may be a boring re recount of, or maybe a boring manual about how to, um, uh, do a certain task on a computer or how to change the carburetor in my car, uh, something that doesn't seem at all creative. I'm still, uh, I'm, I'm writing something out. I'm giving some type of instructions that would be eligible for copyright. And this is, as I said before, this is the one that may have the greatest impact upon you as a hospitality manager um, because if you want to, you know, very likely in your restaurant or your bar, you're going to want to have some ambiance music in the background. You might have that to cover up the kitchen noises or the chatter of other tables. You might do it to establish that certain mood or feel in the restaurant. Let's say you're having, let's say your restaurant is an Italian restaurant, so you might want to have 
you know, an Italian opera playing in the background, or maybe um, you are um, having a Polynesian theme for your restaurant. So you might want to have um, some um, sounds of the ocean, of waves lapping at the shores to kind of create that feeling that you are in Tahiti or someplace like that. Um, if, in that case, you, you for, for an artificial sound maker, you might, you might not actually have a copyright issue, but let's say that um, there's some music associated with it, some, some man-made or woman-made music for that matter. Um, you would need to have the right to use that music. And in order to do that, you're going to have to pay. Um, if you obviously have professional musicians uh, who are in your who are in your hire, then you're paying them to uh, produce those particular songs. Um, that's pretty obvious that you're going to do that. But you, if you decide to put a CD in, or you decide to turn on the television, um, maybe to play that um, NFL game on Monday night that you think people will want to come to your bar to watch, or perhaps it's um, uh, uh, playing even a radio station. All of those things can have uh, copyright implications and since you are doing it not for personal viewing pleasure but for a commercial a purpose you have to make sure that you are following the rules about paying for the use of that copy copyrighted information. So who is the copyright owner? Well of course that's the person who owns the right to that intellectual property usually is going to be the person who wrote the song or performed the song or uh, wrote the book or whatever that particular item is, but the, cop but the initial copywriter could sue it to someone else. Now, there are times where the non-owner gets to use that copyrighted material um, and doesn't have to pay for it. Um, that doesn't apply that often to hospitality uh, industry individuals. Um, many times this has to do with using um, the materials, say, in a review, maybe at, for journalistic purposes or perhaps for educational or scholarly purposes. So, for example, if I wanted to, at this moment, uh, play an excerpt from a popular song and I only took, say, a five or ten second excerpt from a popular song and I say, I'm playing this so you can understand that this is what fair use is, well, I'm doing it for educational or scholarly purposes. Uh, similarly, let's say I had a blog where I reviewed movies and I might play a little excerpt from a movie um, and um, to, to give the audience of, of the audience of people watching my blog an opportunity to, to get a sense as to what I'm talking about when I describe these characteristics of the movie. Well, that would again fall into the fair use category. Um, would a hospitality owner be able to use that fair use idea? Perhaps um, one way I could see that it could become relevant is let's say that you are having some kind of um, entertainment at your facility. And so you might um, have some excerpts from that entertainment available, maybe so that guests can say, hey, you know, we're having the stand up comedian Bob Smith be here, and you might play some excerpts, a couple of his jokes. Um, and so people walking by who hears the jokes, they might say, oh, wow, Bob's pretty funny. I think I'll attend that event. So it can be used kind of for advertising purposes. Um, that might be a fair use situation. Of course, if you played, you know, a two-hour excerpt of his stand-up routine, that wouldn't be a fair usage. Probably you're going to discuss advertising issues along those lines with Bob when you negotiate the contract with him, because obviously it's probably in Bob's interest to get as many people interested in seeing a show as you can. So you probably both have an interest in some kind of fair use of his material. You might also be a situation in which, let's say you rent some space in your uh, hotel for say wedding receptions or bar bat mitzvahs or um, conferences or something like that. And some of the, some from time to time, the people running the facility may want to have um, entertainment. Um, could be a magician or a clown. It could be um, a band or something like that. And you might have a list of recommended bands um, along those lines uh, that, uh, you know, are able to perform. And this is a service to the person who will be renting the space. You've kind of helped them narrow the, the search down. And so you might, for those 
say those four or five approved bands, you might have um, uh, snippets from their performances. Again, they would have an interest in you having snippets. They want the, presumably they want that um, uh, the person who's going to be renting that space to choose them over some other band. And so um, usually there's not going to be a lot of issues with uh, figuring out those logistics, but just be aware there are copyright issues. Um, and by the way, uh, when, let me just go back here for a second. I'm not sure I made this clear. When you use those songs, you broadcast that television show or whatever, um, there's lots of very technical rules about how much you have to pay or whether you have to pay at all. Many times it turns on the size of your facility, um, whether or not you have to pay and how much you have to pay. So just be aware um, that there's, there's uh, lots of variables in that equation. Trade dress. We already talked about trade dress a little bit. Trade dress is related to the idea of trademark. We were talking about trademark before. We were talking about the golden arches, the swoosh. But think for a second about the Starbucks cup. Um, there isn't the you know there isn't a, a green S on the Starbucks cup that is the trademark. It's kind of the whole experience. It's the cardboard sleeve. It's the particular type of lid that they use. It's the green mermaid type looking person. Um, any one of those and kind of all those things together, when you see it, it tells you, oh, that's a Starbucks cup. Um, uh, and, and, but it's not just one of those things. You could maybe even remove one of those things and you would still have that Starbucks-y feeling about the item. Um, and so it's, it's a more amorphous, it's a broader idea, and it's sometimes difficult to define um, what makes that trade dress from one entity to another. It's pretty common for businesses to want to borrow or, or kind of be inspired by, we'll say, the trade dress of one company. Let's say I wanted to open up a coffee bar and I have been impressed by the success that Starbucks has had. So I might design my product line very similarly. I might, you know, have that same cardboard sleeve, but um, I dye mine um, green and I might use a similar lid. Um, um, I might, instead of having a mermaid, I might have a dolphin, um, and, but I have a similar feel artistically to the item. Um, well, under those circumstances, a Starbucks might decide that I have infringed upon its trade dress. Even though it's not identical, it has many similarities to, to a Starbucks. Um, whether I would win or Starbucks would win would be an issue that would be resolved in the courts. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's talk about public domain. When things go into the public domain, for example, after that 17 years in the case of a um, patent, in the case of a copyright, I think it's 70 years after the death of the artist. So if I uh, create an artistic masterpiece when I'm five years old, and let's say I live to be 100, will be seven years, 70 years after my death at age 100. So the copyright for this item would be 95, because I was nine plus five when I produced it. So when I died, there had been 95 years plus the 70, that would be 165 years. On the other hand, let's say, that I produced my great work of art when I was 99. I died the very next day. So 99 and 100, I won in 365th, and then 70 years from that point. So then the copyright would just be 70 years and one day. So you can see copyright does vary based upon kind of at what point in one's life when it, one created that item. Um, you can't extend either a patent or a copyright beyond the date of its expiration. 
if you don't zealously follow, or follow the rules about maintaining the copyright, the trademark, the trade dress, and the patent, you can have that fall out into the public domain earlier. Um, an example of that happening was with um, the a term aspirin. Aspirin rightly should be a copyrighted uh, term or trademarked term. Also, um, the song Happy Birthday has fallen into the public domain. So you do have to protect that. That's one of the reasons why uh, many times companies are zealous about um, enforcing their uh, trademark um, and their copyright. Even when it seems like a relatively harmless use, if a company allows relatively harmless infringement, then later on they aren't going to be able to uh, uh, dispute or um, uh, prohibit another type of infringement that they find more concerning. So it's you have to be consistent in order to maintain that intellectual property interest. I hope that this discussion about leases and intellectual property has been interesting for you. Um, as always, please feel free to email me if you have any questions about the material. In addition, you're welcome to stop by my office if you would like to discuss it in more detail. Thanks for your attention and I hope that you have a great day.